Telling History with the Good Time Girls is a hyper-local podcast about the quirky history of Bellingham, Washington, and the fourth corner of these United States. Even though we like to keep things close to home, these stories are no less entertaining to the masses and those who find themselves, unfortunately, outside of the PNW. We are your hosts. My name is Ren. And I'm Colby. And we are the co-owners of Belling History Tours, also known as the Good Time Girls. If you want to know more about our tour business, visit our website at bellinghistory.com. Today's episode is called Big Birds in Bad Town, or Birds of a Feather Stick Together in Bad Conditions for the Benefit of Rich Edwardians. Some content warning on this one. We've got some animal stuff, real Tiger King shit, some language, (laughs) a little bit of uh, death and mayhem. Colby? Yes. Ostriches. (laughs) What do you know about the big birds? Not much. Not much. I don't know that I've ever seen an ostrich, even in a zoo. Even in a zoo? You've never seen one of these bad boys? They are the most terrifying creatures. On the planet, they're like gig- giant dinosaur yeah, birds. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. My, I grew up in Southern Oregon, and there was this roadside attraction zoo, the Wildlife Safari. You know, comment <laughs> if you've been there before. But the Wildlife Safari, you drive through it, and then all these ostriches will just come up to your car, and they want to look for snacks. So you roll down your windows, and they'll stick their giant like uh, dinosaur heads, no. like fucking Jurassic no, Park. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what I learned about ostriches is that they're big and scary and they really like Funyuns. You know what I'm terrified of? Mm. Turkeys. <laughs> so like ostriches are just kind of like big turkeys. Giant turkeys with bigger <laughs> talons. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so now we've established what we know about them. But we know more about them now because we're history nerds. That is right. There used to be an ostrich farm here in the old Bellingham, old bad town. Uh, So at various points in history, the idea of farming ostriches seemed to take off like some kind of weird pyramid scheme. And here in Bellingham, we also had an ostrich farm or two and emu farms, which are just smaller, just as creepy giant birds. But these were short lived. They do make for a pretty entertaining story that one in particular, Hill's Ostrich Farm. Yeah, this story fascinates me. It happened right near where I grew up by Whatcom Falls Park. So we want to start by reading an article, an editorial article in the Herald from 1965, titled, Things We Never Knew About Our Hometown. Since Chief Chowitzit and his colleagues paddled a couple of young fellows named Hank Roeder and Russ Peabody up to the mouth of Whatcom Creek to cut lumber for the booming San Francisco market 112 years ago, some colorful commercial enterprises have been conducted on our Bellingham Bay. There have been breweries and small cigar factories and a sugar beet plant and dozens of other enterprises that started, thrived for a time, and finally succumbed to changing economic or legal conditions. But a postcard sent to us by a local woman the other day revealed one that was brand new to us. It showed a picture of seven long-necked birds and one average-necked male human inside an enclosure. The legend said, Hills Ostrich Farm, Bellingham, Washington. So the center of this postcard had found it in the belongings of a relative who had passed away and sent it in wondering if any information could be uncovered about it. Yes, I actually have a one of these postcards. Oh. They're floating around out there, so you might find one at an antique store yes. or Hills Ostrich Farm here in Bellingham. So this editorial continues, um, and I quote, Well, we were flabbergasted too. Ostriches always have been associated in our minds with Africa and maybe other hot climates, but not the Puget Sound. But sure enough, our trusty old 1911 Polk's Directory for Bellingham and Whatcom County lists William E. Hill as the proprietor of Hill's Ostrich Farm. So it was only listed in the directory that one year, and they wondered, and I'm going to quote again, whether the plume market never developed or whether the ostriches just didn't go for the cool, damp Puget Sound climate remains a mystery. Perhaps some old timer who recalls some of the details will send in some more information. 
And then there's another fun quote. They also said, We've heard it said that some Bellingham people, when confronted with new ideas, stick their heads in the sand like ostriches are supposed to do. It's intriguing to learn that we once had the real thing around here. Oh, wow. They're so clever. (laughs) That was some good 1968 humor. So yeah, after this editorial rant, a few people did write letters in with their experiences at Bellingham's ostrich farm, such as a woman whose hat pin was almost eaten by an ostrich. And someone who signed their name B.A. Bird wrote a letter to the editor of the Bellingham Herald telling this fabulous story of ostrich liberation called The Great Ostrich Chase. When I was a boy living near the lake, we had a terribly hard winter one year before the World War. Some other boys and I decided one cold night to take one of the ostriches from the park. We had little trouble getting the ostriches from the building, although they raised a real fuss and kicked us good. When we got the one outside, it broke loose and started running across the ice on the lake. We chased it for about a half a mile down the lake, then came to open water where we thought we had it cornered. One boy even grabbed a leg. Now I know ostriches cannot fly, but this one jumped or flew out over the open water with the boy hanging on. The boy fell in about 20 feet out, and the ostrich was still in the air when it disappeared from sight in the dark. We pulled the boy out and figured the ostrich drowned, but later on that winter, we heard that a family down at the south end of the lake had shot a strange-looking 50-pound wild turkey for Christmas dinner. See turkeys. See turkeys. (laughs) I wonder what really happened. Like, do you think the ostrich drowned, or could it really fly, or can they swim, paddle? Uh, Well, according to the Google... (laughs) Um, ostriches can keep themselves afloat in the water. So okay. they just like float on top of the water and use their giant legs to like swim and paddle. It sounds like that is a little bit rare. And I can't imagine this poor thing did very well in the freezing oh my God. like wat tub. Hypothermia. I know. <laughs> for a bird meant to live in Africa. So I love that the author signed B A Bird spelled B Y R D. I actually like tried to look that up because I thought at first it was an actual name and then I realized oh <laughs> yeah, I think it's safe to assume that B.A. Bird definitely stands for Big Ass Bird. Um, <laughs> the fact that there were no citizens with those initials is just probably a very happy coincidence. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we had to dive deeper into this story. Because why in the name of Rotor and Peabody would a person endeavor to start an ostrich farm in the early 1900s in Bellingham? Yes, let's solve the mystery. We've got the deets. Okay. Okay, so the ostrich farm was indeed started by a man named William E. Hill. And what we know about him is he was born in 1846 in Wisconsin. He had a life and whatnot. He had some kids. He eventually moved to Bellingham by about 1906, started a secondhand furniture store on Ilk Street, which is today's State Street. And around 1910, he made a wagon trip to California, and the newspaper jokingly talked about it, and they said, quote, W.E. Hill, who recently returned from an overland trip through California, says, The best paying industry in California is that of dressing fleas for souvenirs. Times are so quiet that many of the stores don't open till about noon. Bellingham is better than any place I saw. A great many people are coming north to Washington as soon as they can sell out. So, yeah, I interpret this as a kind of a joke on Hill. <laughs> also, he was probably known to be looking for money-making schemes. Um, he's like that Amway uncle. <laughs> he's that guy. I, there's so much to unpack from that statement. I love the, the phrase, dressing fleas for souvenirs. <laughs> just the best old-timey like a flea circus yes i love that it's such great imagery so soon after they reported on the ostrich plans and that he purchased 25 mature ostriches in california and had bought and cleared a number of lots near the whatcom falls streetcar station with plans to open an ostrich farm in may of 1911 so colby where exactly are we talking about for the for the modern belling hamster Yeah, it's kind of hard to say exactly. I haven't dug into deed research, but our best guess is in the vicinity of where today, if you know where the Wacom Falls mini market is, across the street, there's a Kingdom Hall, Jehovah Witness Church on Electric Avenue near the entrance to Wacom Falls Park there. So there was a streetcar stop right there. And there was before the gas station, there was a little tiny store there. Mm -hmm. So it was across the street from there. That's basically what we know. Also, he didn't get 25 ostriches, but we'll get we'll get into that. Yeah. There's a lot of sleuthing we had to do about these 
birds. So there's a, another quote from him in the article in the Herald, and they say, quote, while admitting that the enterprise is somewhat of an innovation for this section of the country, Hill declares his belief that with proper care and shelter, the plumage producers will thrive here. So his plan was to lay steam pipes throughout the quarters in order to maintain a suitable temperature for these ostriches. He had about an acre of land and put a high board fence around it. Ostriches had a large hen house sort of shelter as well. And Hill had an office slash storeroom where he could sell the plumes. People did not take Hill seriously, <laughs> so you can imagine. Uh, but Hill's re- reply was always, you wait and watch me. I will have some real birds ready to enter in the next Bellingham poultry show. <laughs> I love that. So, of course, we had to wonder, why would anyone attempt to start an ostrich farm in Bellingham or anywhere in the Pacific Northwest? Just the trouble of having to, like, put pipes in the ground and make the environment suitable. It just seems like a crazy idea. So what was the motivation for ostrich farms anywhere, really? Yeah, good question. It sounds some like some real white man ingenuity. <laughs> What's happening in the country at this point is Edwardians. Uh, This is the Edwardian era, and these ladies liked big hats, and they liked big plumage. I like big plumage, and I cannot lie, right? And (laughs) as, as we all know, the saying goes, the bigger the plumage, the closer to God, right? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was the fashion back then for huge hats with huge piles of flowers and feathers and all kinds of crap on top. Even the use of whole stuffed birds as adornment. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes way back. Like Marie Antoinette was way into the feather plumage. Soldiers wore them in hats. There's a word called panache, which actually comes from having a feather in one's hat. So all these little trivias you learn studying bird plumage on heads. Oh my gosh, I really like that. Panache. Mm -hmm. To have a giant ass feather in your hat. Yep. Love it. Call it macaroni. <laughs> call it call it macaroni. Uh, so unfortunately, the fashion market for ostrich feathers meant massive slaughter of these birds. Uh, before the 1860s, all of the ostrich feathers that reached Britain were taken from wild birds that were slaughtered during a hunt. They were chased on horseback until exhausted or shot, and populations of these wild birds rapidly depleted. So by 1850, wild ostriches were nearing extinction. Enter ostrich farming. Right. People figured out they could farm the birds and pluck their feathers while in captivity, and they didn't even have to kill them. At least ostriches. Farmed ostrich feathers dominated the trade and saved wild ostriches from extinction, and it was lucrative. In 1880, ostrich feather value per pound was almost equal to that of diamonds. (laughs) (laughs) Damn. Ostriches, though, they weren't the only birds whose feathers were used for hats. The fashion for feathered hats reached new heights in the Victorian era, just previous, and Edwardians took this to a new level. So ladies often assumed that these feathers were naturally molted, um, and not all of these birds being killed, or maybe they just didn't care. Uh, Many species of these birds whose feathers were used could not be farmed like ostriches. Yeah, it's pretty rough. We're going to come back to the feathered hat craze and what happened next, but first we're going to get back to ostrich farming in the United States. Yep, so it was pretty clear that the United States had some climate that ostriches would probably do well in. The first U.S. ostrich farm opened in Los Angeles, California in 1883 by an English naturalist named Charles Sketchley. So previously, the only way to get feathers was to import them from Africa, right? Right, yeah. Exceptional ostrich feathers from Africa could fetch as much as $5 a piece on the market. A single mature bird could produce about $250 worth of feathers each year. And if that seems like a lot to you, it was. In today's money, that is around $150 for one feather and $7,500 per year on one bird. The farm was meant to be for production, but it wasn't long before hundreds of people were showing up each day to get a look at the exotic birds, and Sketchly began to charge 50 cents for admission. 
1885, the ranch was moved to business partner Griffith J. Griffith's land above the Los Angeles River. So the Chicago Daily Tribune wrote, To those who are unfamiliar with the appearance of an ostrich, it may be described as resembling nothing more than a large gas pipe set on tall and muscular legs. An ostrich is apparently the most ill-tempered bird in existence. They never acquire a fondness for anyone. They are always on the lookout to kick someone, and if the kick has the intended effect, it is pretty sure to be fatal. A curious fact about the bird is that it never kicks unless it can see its adversary, explains the Tribune. The ostrich men have utilized this peculiarity, and before plucking, they draw a long stocking down the neck of the birds, completely blindfolding him. One of the keepers overlooked a hole in the stocking recently and had a narrow escape, the Tribune's (laughs) correspondent added. In 1886, nearby landowners and investors built the Ostrich Farm Railway to transport tourists back and forth. The park closed not long after in 1889 due to financial difficulties, and that railway became part of the first great electric railway linking Los Angeles and Santa Monica. The winding route that originally ran through Echo Park and Silver Lake became Sunset Boulevard. Oh my gosh! (laughs) Thank you, ostriches! (laughs) What would we do without you? There was another big ostrich farm that opened a few years after by Edwin Costin. Costin's was located in the Arroyo Seco Valley, just three miles north of downtown Los Angeles. Costin's ostrich farm lasted much longer than Sketchley's. It opened in 1896 and closed in 1934. It occupied nine acres and had over a hundred ostriches on the farm. A fun little quote about Costin's that I love says, Mr. Pearson, manager of the ostrich farm, is training one of his finest birds, which he has named Admiral Dewey, to drive. And he will soon be prepared to offer the ladies a ride in an ostrich carriage, which no doubt will relieve somewhat the demands upon the Montgomery Ward & Co.'s horseless electric carriage. A carriage ride behind an untrained ostrich would certainly be exhilarating. The wagon that they were talking about is made by the Studebaker brothers, which I think is kind of fun. fun. And they mentioned the Montgomery Ward and Co. who made the train. Just all kinds of people investing. And of course, (laughs) our beloved Admiral Dewey. Who was apparently a Navy admiral from the Spanish-American War with a cool mustache. So we actually have photos in the... There's great local photos in... Galen Byrie's collection at the Whatcom Museum in an album, but there's a trip to Costin's where they took all these photos. It was a huge tourist attraction during that era. And then you start seeing articles in Washington papers around the turn of the 20th century about all these crazy California ostrich farms, and pretty soon you're seeing ads for them popping up in northern climes, Seattle, and so on, where you could buy stock and invest in these ostrich farms. So it kind of becomes this little craze in the early 90s. 1900s. So in 1907, you see the American Ostrich Company in Seattle selling stocks and advertising. There's a great article that same year from October that really lays out the plan. They say, the first thing to do is get your ostriches. These can be obtained full size guaranteed layers in Arizona and California at $300 a pair. Don't pay more. The Washington papers state that ostriches are worth $2,000 each. This is a mistake. And looks like an endeavor to sell some other kind of stock besides ostriches to the innocent people of Washington. Ten birds of $150 each will make a nice farm. Perhaps a harbinger of things to come was when in 1909, Seattle papers reported on folks who had previously bought stock in the American Ostrich Company were writing to the mayor to find out what the hell had happened to the company. And the quote is, the police have learned as the result of an investigation, the company has disappeared from its elegant offices in the Empire Building. And near as can be estimated, the gullible public is out about $15,000. The company broke into print two years ago with the promise of a magnificent ostrich farm near Green Lake. It sold stock to all who would buy, and from the police records, it can be said that it sold lots and lots of stock. No dividends have been declared, and the nearest company ever came to owning an ostrich was when it bought a picture of the bird and put it on its stationery. So there you go. (laughs) So Seattle did get an ostrich farm in May of that year at Luna Park in West Seattle, and it was kind of a sideshow gambit. The ostriches were said to come from Florida, and again, they'd hitch them to a wagon, drive them around, and that kind of a thing. It's unclear what became of those Luna Park ostriches, but at one point they did advertise 
the human ostrich, which I was like, what? (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What? (laughs) And then we looked that up, and apparently this is a sideshow performer who will just eat anything not fit for normal human consumption, like tacks and razor blades. Yeah. Cool. What I do remember from that is that there's a difference. There's the ostrich people, which are ingesters, oh, right? God. Digesters, ingesters. And then there's the, the regurgitators. Oh. So some people <laughs> eat those things and throw them back up. But the, a, uh, the ostrich show. people. Okay. They just, what, poop it, them out? Yep. Wow. <laughs> That's the best I can imagine. Sounds painful. <laughs> I don't imagine much more than that. Anyway, back to Bellingham. All right. (laughs) (laughs) So the Bellingham birds arrived in Seattle of April 1911 on a steamship. There were only 12, not 25. So six mated pairs because ostriches mate for life, apparently. And if one dies, they'll even refuse another mate. They'll pine away to their own death. Each ostrich was in its own seven foot tall crate. And these 12 ostriches reportedly cost around $3,000. Again, we're seeing a lot of numbers thrown around that vary wildly, so who knows. It was said to depend on the quality of the feathers, what the value was, and males were preferable. And the birds apparently needed to eat like five pounds of alfalfa a day. They also apparently ate a bunch of other stuff. Yes, (laughs) they could eat anything. (laughs) And they would. The Seattle papers reported on their arrival, Big birds furnish lots of amusement. Passengers feed them everything in sight. Victims of nervousness, but not seasickness during the trip. So this was unlike Hill, uh, who had apparently accompanied these birds on the voyage, but became so sick that he had to abandon the ship, and he took the train home, leaving the birds to continue on alone. The papers described people feeding them oranges to see them go down the ostrich's long necks like a string of beads. I just love that's like totally right out of the cartoons. I love it. And the paper also said, I love this, they had eaten almost everything on the ship from scrap tin to doorknobs. A Harlem goat has nothing on them. Curious George. Who's read the Curious George books? (laughs) When the ostrich swallows, George's bugle goes down his neck and George, I think George was like feeding him all kinds of stuff to watch it go down his neck. That was like a classic. I know, there's truth to it. And now we know why the ostrich people eat all the weird stuff. (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh so the ostriches were then they get off the boat they get off the boat and then they're put on a train to bellingham they arrived here on april 8th shortly before midnight and then were put on a flat car on the streetcar line to take them out to hill's property the streetcar line ran out basically it went out the Alabama area and came up Woburn Street and then went out what is Lakeway today to Electric Avenue Mm -hmm. and then out to Silver Beach neighborhood because there was an amusement park there. So if you took that streetcar line, you'd end up, you could pass the ostrich farm, get off and see some ostriches. All kinds of fun out there. (laughs) So at this point, Hill's ads started appearing in the local papers. Quote, see the real ostrich in Bellingham. Twelve of the big birds may be seen at your leisure. This is a rare treat to those who have never seen a farm of ostrich. Admission, 25 cents. All right, a little cheaper than California. (laughs) You take a late car and get off at Whatcom Falls Old Picnic Grounds. We repair willow plumes and have a beautiful display of the choicest new plumes on the coast. It will pay you to see us. Bellingham Ostrich Farm, W.E. Hill. Hear that, ladies? I know. It's going to pay you. I uh, went and looked up the willow plumes because I think that's interesting. I had no idea. I'd never heard of that. But those are apparently when you see the big ostrich plumes, sometimes they'll dye them. They'll put like multiple ones together and then they'll be all like like a little yeah. waterfall of yeah. ostrich it, plumes. It reminds me of like a palm tree. Yes. Yes. It's very exotic looking. And those were obviously more expensive and you could have them repaired here. But the ones you, you find like vintage ones. And they are crazy expensive. (laughs) So yeah, and there used to be, this was kind of a a gig. You could have tying ostrich plumes together. And the people came to see the ostriches. And there's this great story by one a local historian who's one of my favorites, George Hunsby, who wrote The Birth, Death, and Resurrection of Fairhaven, Volumes 1 and 2, <laughs> and also had a lovely column in the Herald for many years with all his reminiscences. And he grew up in the Fairhaven area, but he talked all about Bellingham. And he had a great story about the ostrich farm. And he says, At that time, ostrich plumes were much in demand for those broad florid 
Toradora hats that women wore. I was still wearing the bloomer pants that boys hated so much, so it must have been around 1910 or 1911 when that fellow located his ostrich farm on Electric Avenue on Cedar Landing on the Lake Whatcom streetcar line. One day I managed to scare up streetcar fare to go out and view those ostriches, since I had never seen one. When I got off the streetcar, it was a short walk up to the six-foot board fence that enclosed the entire ostrich farm. I had arrived just in time to see the owner feeding the birds some very small oranges, which I could follow as they progressed down the ostrich's long necks. Wow, again with the oranges. <laughs> these poor, I mean, it can't be the best for digestion, these poor <laughs> just ostriches. Just whole oranges. I know. <laughs> I don't know. S- several folks wrote letters to the editor in this that of that 1965 article, um, and they also mentioned the oranges. It was a whole thing. Oh, God. But they're ostriches. They can eat anything. I guess they have digestion like a goat. Good for them. Maybe they poop them out. <laughs> oh, yeah. It just adds to their creepiness. <laughs> I love this. Hunsby's story continues. Being a curious youngster, I asked the owner many questions concerning that new business, and he told me that they had discovered one ostrich egg would produce enough yolk to make six full-size custard pies. A week or two later, I thought that I would give my sister a treat by taking her out to see the wonderful ostrich farm. The two of us had arrived to view the ostriches and stood outside that board fence. She happened to be wearing a brand new sailor straw hat. One of the largest ostriches spied that hat and deemed it to be editable. Edible. I like like editable. I like editable too. Same difference. We're in podcast mode. He reached over the fence and clamped onto her hat, taking a large pie shaped segment out of it. As he turned his hind end toward us, I retaliated by grabbing one of his gorgeous plumes in my fist. The ostrich, feeling my pole on his plume, gave a mighty lurch and jumped at least 20 feet inward. But I had a firm grip on that plume, and when the ostrich landed, I was the plume's possessor. And for free. But the ostrich venture turned out to be short-lived, and I never did get to sample any ostrich egg custard pie. I know. I'm kind of curious about why the eggs weren't more of a thing. Maybe they don't lay very many? Yeah, that could be. Because it doesn't seem like that really took off either. No. (laughs) No, it doesn't. Uh, Anyway, trouble soon started when one of the male ostriches named Big Ben had to be put to death at the end of April. Apparently, he had received injuries during the shipment. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. eating all that weird shit on the mm-hmm. boat. Um, but there was no hope of recovery. Naturally, a local taxidermist was really excited to stuff the bird and exhibit him. I bet he was. Those taxidermists so, are weirdos. So <laughs> I'm wondering, like, did that happen? And where is said stuffed ostrich? Yeah, I haven't seen one. No museum? Do you guys stuffed ostrich? I know. Anybody want to pipe up? If you happen to just find <laughs> one in your grandma's attic, do let us know. That's Big Ben you've got on your hands. <laughs> Local treasure. <laughs> so Hill's ads continued to run throughout the year, but late in 1911, in wintertime, he had clearly lost another bird to the boys of the great ostrich chase caper that we talked about. Oh, I wonder if it was different mated pairs and now he's just screwed because... I know. Yeah. We we talked about that and how they, they mate for life yeah. and, and they get really sad yeah. and it's just like, oh. I hope they stole the random unmated one that was just pining away. I know. And she could just fly free. <laughs> Become a Christmas turkey. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Where were we? Uh, in January of 1912, it was reported that Hill's ostriches were now being shipped to Seattle. His Bellingham ostrich farm had lasted all of 10 months. Hill had a new plan for his 10 remaining birds, though. He had found a hillside area in Seattle that he believed was a more suitable location for this farm. <laughs> Not really sure how a hillside in Seattle I differs know. from, like, Lake Wacom, but... It doesn't. In March, ads appeared in the Seattle paper saying, Ladies, Hill's Ostrich Farm is now open. We have all the latest color and plumes and all the latest designs and fancy trimmings made from ostrich products. We dye to any color or shade on short notice and guarantee satisfaction. That is all in caps. You can take the Madison streetcar to our door and spend Easter afternoon with our herd of African Nubians. Mm. Yeah, (laughs) it's rough. Okay, but by May, the Seattle's farm's fate was also in the air. It didn't last long. He had partnered with another guy who apparently had taken more than his share of the money and done none of the work. And by June, that he was doing a closeout sale on ostrich plumes. So the farm had folded. 
And it's not clear what Hill did with the rest of the birds. Uh, presumably he sold them off to some other sucker, but <laughs> or maybe some taxidermist got a hold of them. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, but we do know what happened to William Hill. And that's that he came back to Bellingham, where he passed away just a few short years later in 1914. He was buried in his family plot in Yakima County. And his obituary read, Former businessman of city passes away, William Edwin Hill, who was in the furniture business on Elk Street for seven or eight years, passed away last Friday at his home at the age of 68 years. Diabetes was the cause of death. Mr. Hill came here about 10 years ago from North Yakima. After quitting the furniture business three years ago, he purchased a small herd of ostriches and kept them on a farm near Silver Beach. He had been ill for some time prior to his death and had not been in business since he disposed of his ostriches. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. 68 though. He lived a long life and he was farming ostriches at an old age. <laughs> <laughs> with diabetes. That's hard work. I'm surprised he made it out. <laughs> so eventually what happens is the ostrich farm craze of the early 1900s dies out because feathers were falling out of fashion. Fashion is a, a fickle madam. Fickle feather. Mm-hmm. And then also women who were aware of the bird atrocities involved tried to convince their fashionable friends to forego the feathered adornments. They formed groups like the Society for Protection of Birds, the Fur and Feather League in Europe, and in the U.S., the Audubon Society. They fought a long verbal battle with millinery trade that culminated with the 1918 Migratory Bird Act. Around that same time, fashion changed for another reason. Riding in automobiles made it hard to wear large flamboyant hats. Um, in 1934, an article on the fate of Costrinch Ostrich Farm in Pasadena <laughs> reads, Change of fashions ruins the unusual industry. Quote, when women wore ostrich plumes on their hats and languidly waved them in gorgeous fans, the Costin Ostrich Farm was a veritable gold mine for its owners. But with ostrich feathers no longer in demand, except by fan dancers like Sally Rand, the Pasadena Farm will be offered at auction to satisfy a county tax claim of $432. I love that. Sally Rand was a burlesque performer. That's right. And that's the main reason for feathers nowadays, right? Like <laughs> Pretty the, much. Yeah. That's, that's, that's your market. That's where we use them. Yeah. <laughs> so Bellingham's short-lived ostrich farm falls into obscurity. And these later recollections kind of bring it back into the public's attention in the 1965 editorial. And then we see it again coming back in the 1990s when... Emus, the cousins of the ostriches, made their appearance and with another sort of revival. I don't want to offend any like real like emu stands, but <laughs> I think as far as I could tell, they're a little shorter and they have fuzzier necks. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. They're like kind of boring and brown. <laughs> yeah. Still emus. And Reyes is Good another birds. one, apparently. Yeah. Okay. We learned a lot they're about They're ratites. Ratites. Yes. Which is an awesome... I know, that is a pretty good, like, what do you call that? <laughs> it's my gang Classification. Name. <laughs> <laughs> We're the ratites. <laughs> All right, fair. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so in the 1990s, the ratite farming became a trend again, and that includes the ostrich's cousins, the emus and the reyes. And in September of 1992, the Herald ran a Northwest profile piece on ratite farming. Which was an interview with my middle school physical education teacher, Wally Cavanis. Coach Cavanis. I know some of you out there in Bellingham land who are locals will, <laughs> will remember Jolly Wally. So Wally apparently had to retire early in 1986 due to health problems and started his animal <laughs> farming businesses out on the Mount Baker Highway. So at this time he was raising mainly emus, but he had other ratites as well. And his plan was to make a profit from the products that you could make from these birds, which was meat, oil, hide, eggs, and feathers, of course. But at the time, he was only selling them for breeding purposes and was planning to transition to products market within the next five years or so. All right. So decidedly more utilitarian this time. <laughs> An article later in the year titled Big Birds, Big Bucks, Big Risks 
<laughs> oh, that is such a 90s headline. Uh, described Cavanus as an exotic animal raiser who had abandoned his unprofitable Bellingham Wildlife Sanctuary after becoming sold on emus. He had a total of 52 emus with 11 breeding pairs, as well as a few ostriches and rayas. Countywide, other folks had also jumped on the ratite ranch trend, and there was some competitiveness with differences of opinion over which type of bird was best. I love this quote, because my coach Cavanis was quoted as saying, Sometimes you like a Chrysler, sometimes you like a Ford, but they're basically the same. We gotta work together, which they did. They pushed through some legislation to recognize their businesses that year. But then when he was asked about the growing animal rights movement and campaigns to end animal products such as they were trying to cultivate, (laughs) Cavanis said, what can we do? They have their opinions and we have ours. How it will affect us? I have no idea. That's a decent way to look at things, I suppose. Also, (laughs) the Chrysler Ford analogy makes no (laughs) sense to me whatsoever. I'm like, emus, rays, ostriches, Chrysler Ford. I I suppose. I think you need to know more about A, cars, and B, (laughs) ratites in order to get that analogy. True. True. I know nothing about (laughs) either. Me neither. In 1994, the Herald also reported about fourth corner ostriches in Linden, whose owners were trying to promote ostrich farming and recruit others to the venture at the NWW Fair in Linden. Part of the goal was to warm people to the idea of ostrich meat, which everyone swears tastes like steak filet. (laughs) <laughs> but at $30 a pound of processed ostrich, the price was still prohibitive. But by 1995, Bob's Burgers and Brew became the first restaurant to serve ostrich burgers at their High Notes Corner location. The burgers were $3 more than a beef burger, but they had fewer calories, grams of fat, etc. Folks involved thought they'd found a way to make quick money and they had sold their 25 cows to buy four ostriches. <laughs> the article that describes this in 1995 was titled Rancher Gets Roped into Ostrich Farm. <laughs> oh boy. Which again sounds like people really had not a lot of high hopes for these, <laughs> these ventures. And mostly the ostriches had to be sold as breeding stock. And again, they're they're mm. trying to sell the meat as they can. And Barkley Hagen's sold some of the meat. Dirty Dan Harris's restaurant, the Cliff House. So I want to know if anyone out there had some ostrich fillets, because oh. I never have eaten any. Have you? I remember it being on the menu, but no. I never (laughs) ate any. It was not not going to happen. But the price was just prohibitive and without more people. So this was a thing. They were always trying to push it like, hey, everyone should start raising ostriches because then it won't be so price prohibitive. But then I'm like, then you're also not making as much money. So what? I feel like, yeah, you're you're not making as much money. You're raising a much more dangerous animal (laughs) than a fucking cow. I don't know. I'm not a farmer. But let's just say. I mean, a cow's not going to rip your No, they don't have talons. And they're gonna yeah slay you um also i love i think i feel like if woody guthrie were still around today he would have written a song about this you sold your 25 cows for four ostriches <laughs> that's a lot of cows for four dickhead birds <laughs> for real because they're not really friendly in the 2003 autobiography johnny cash wrote about his own near-death encounter with one of his pet ostriches that were living at Cash's exotic animal park okay, okay, in Tennessee. I so, know, that's... Okay. Mm-hmm. Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Talking about I Walk the Line. <laughs> Folsom Prison Blues. Johnny Cash just happened to own ostriches. Uh, no, not just own ostriches. He had an exotic animal park oh, of God. his own. <laughs> so Tiger King. In Tennessee. Yeah. Let's not go there for Johnny. Don't disrespect Johnny like that. But yes, he had one. And Cash recalled in the autobiography, he recalled the moment by saying, I wish I had a Johnny Cash impression for you all, but I don't. So here you go. The ostrich didn't care. When I came back, I was carrying a good stout stick, a six foot stick, and I was prepared to use it. And sure enough, there he was on the trail in front of me doing his thing. When he started moving toward me, I went on the offensive, taking a good hard swipe at him. I missed. He wasn't there. He was in the air, and a split second later, he was on his way down again, with that big toe of his, larger than my size 13 shoe, extended toward my stomach. He made contact. 
I'm sure there was never any question he wouldn't, and frankly, I got off lightly. All he did was break my two lower ribs and rip my stomach open down to my belt. If the belt hadn't been good and strong with a solid belt buckle, he'd have spilled my guts exactly the way he meant to. As it was, he knocked me over onto my back and I broke three more ribs on a rock. But I had sense enough to keep swinging the stick so he didn't get to finish me. I scored a good hit on one of his legs and then he ran off. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yes. A ostrich almost took out Johnny Cash. Can you imagine if that was the end of Johnny Cash? Elvis <laughs> dies on a toilet and Johnny Cash <laughs> dies because an ostrich ripped his stomach open. Thank God for that belt. I know. <laughs> oh, Johnny. Oh. <laughs> It just gets crazier. So we're in 1999 now, almost here to the new millennium. Uh, and a man was killed by an ostrich in Winlock in Lewis County, Washington. The bird was named King Tut and weighed 400 pounds and was part of an exotic animal farm, which was mostly llamas, apparently, as it was called, I love this, Linda's Lavishing Llamas, <laughs> run by the killed man's daughter, Linda Carter. Linda's Lavishing Llamas. Uh, <laughs> now, we're definitely getting into Tiger King territory here. Yeah, there's also, some real Carol Baskin energy isn't happening. Isn't Linda Carter Wonder Woman? Yes. Okay. She is. But not the same Linda Carter. And she's not, it's not a Carter of the Carter Cash family. <laughs> the famous Just Carter totally singers. unrelated Linda Carter. Okay, yes, exactly. Don't get confused. This, La is, this, this is, is Llama Linda. Linda of Lavishing Llamas. <laughs> okay, can we talk about the name of the farm? <laughs> Linda's lavishing llamas <laughs> isn't lavishing a verb I mean do the llamas lavish you <laughs> as I in really like so. shower you with something like saliva maybe <laughs> yeah I so technically I don't think you need the ing if it's an adjective describing the llamas, right? We, lavish can be the right. adjective or a verb. If the term is supposed to describe the llamas, it should have probably been like Linda's lavish llamas, where lavish, you know, means extravagant in this case. And as a <laughs> verb, to lavish someone with something is like to give them a lot of something. So like you said, yeah, maybe the saliva, maybe... I just think of them spit. Don't they spit? They, yeah, I guess they spit. <laughs> That's a thing that llamas do. Anyway, so, okay, I'm looking at this article about this incident with King Tut at Linda's Lavishing Llamas, and it has a photo of Linda Carter feeding King Tut some straw or something through the fence, and she's she's looking pretty cute in a plaid house dress straight out of the 1980s, kind of like with a little yeah. ruffle, like yeah. a little prairie style. Uh huh. And she's got the grass in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Oh, <laughs> And now I just feel, I feel a little, like I'm being a little snooty, <laughs> making fun of these white trash folks or something. But it kind of just, yeah, it, it evokes something like out of Tiger King reality television world <laughs> or something. <laughs> right? Hey, all you bad birds and bitches. <laughs> oh, God. So Linda apparently had come to Bellingham to visit relatives for the weekend, left her dad in charge of the lavishing llama farm, but returned home to find that King Tut had killed her dad. She found him dead in the pen. The ostrich had taken him out. He was 81 years old, but poor guy, his neck was fractured horribly. He was afraid of ostriches in the first place and was only supposed to throw food over the fence. No one knew why he went into the pen. The attack was blamed on King Tut, feeling threatened by a man entering his pen during the mating season. I mean, Oops. I can't imagine there's a time when you wouldn't, <laughs> when the ostrich wouldn't yeah. be threatened just by never, the man. Just never enter you Just the pen. don't go in there. This speculated he may have become confused and gone into the pen. Though he was known to have heart troubles, the cause of death was found to lay squarely with the ostrich. The man's sons pressed for the bird to be put to death for killing their father. Quote, I lost a dog because he bit somebody and you're telling me a bird kills a man and he lives? I can't see Linda defending that damn bird. I don't understand that at all. If it had been my bird, the thing would have been shot last weekend. Oh my gosh. So, and then we also learned that the dad was scared of the birds already because he'd previously come upon another ostrich named Hercules <laughs> that had kicked a ladder out from under him. And other son says he didn't like them damn birds at all. You know, I'm really feeling like there's kind of maybe a, like a horror film <laughs> lurking in here somewhere. Like, yeah, where's ostrich, the ostrich horror? Ostrich horror. That's... Ostriches and turkeys. 
Yeah. It's untapped. <laughs> Terrifying. Okay, so in the end, no charges were filed. King Tut was allowed to live <laughs> for a little while because later he broke a child's arm. And at that point, they were like, okay, you're done. Mm. And he was converted to ostrich jerky, I quote. <laughs> So this, the it ostrich gets, pen it gets better. <laughs> at Linda's Lavishing Llama Farm gets converted to a chapel called Pet Heaven, where you could have funerals and weddings for your pets. Linda, Linda, Linda. I, I, I'm kind of dying to know. I doubt it's still a thing because this was the 90s, but, but <laughs> still. <laughs> Road trip. I know. Does anybody have any pets they want to get married? Because good time girls would be happy to sponsor. <laughs> So a thing. So we had an ostrich farm in Bellingham, Colby, and we, did. we went down a ra- we went down a real rabbit hole. I feel like <laughs> today. Yes, we did an ostrich hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, indeed. What do you think the moral of the story is? I don't know. Combining, you know, exotic animals and capitalism. Huh. Maybe. Maybe not. Not great. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> And we have the Tiger King to prove it once and for all. But I still don't think that's going to deter the people. I know. Any minute now, there's going to be an ostrich meat revolution. I know it. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Well, Or we'll start eating parakeets or something. Best of luck. I'm, I'm, anyone who has the, like... If you can get it on the ground floor, that's where, that's where the real money is. <laughs> one day, though, we're going to get you to meet one of them. You have to see one. I know. It's an experience, yeah. especially now. Well, I think the moral of the story is always wear a good belt buckle. <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I feel like you never know. When you might meet a might walk angry, down a trail. angry ostrich. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there ain't no six foot sticks around. You just hope for the best. Oh, God. At least they won't spill your bowels all over. Oof. I know. Sorry, that got dark. <laughs> <laughs> I All like right. it though. I think, <laughs> thank you, Johnny Cash. I mean, again, he's just the gift that keeps yeah. on giving. Okay. Oh, and if you guys need like a little little refresher on angry ostriches, that's fun. You can check out this episode of The Simpsons mm-hmm. about Ostrich Land. Yes, Ostrich Land, where they they send Santa's little helper to the ostrich farm to live out his days. <laughs> It's it's classic Simpsons. It is classic. Um, <laughs> highly suggest. And also, I think Ostrich Land USA is is still a thing. Yes, there so. is still one. Uh, so Ostrich Land is in Solvang, California, on the central coast uh, near Santa Barbara. Yeah, and it seems like there's a bunch of small ostrich farms pretty much all around the country. A lot of places that are dry and warm, like California, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, so there's also the Wildlife Safari in Winston, Oregon, where you can feed ostriches funyuns to your heart's content. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to go see ostriches, you totally can. There's there's places. <laughs> Just be careful. Yeah, and wear a big belt buckle. <laughs> <laughs> big birds. Big birds. <laughs> big bird bitches. <laughs> All right, we're thank you. We'd like to thank you for listening to Belling History with the Good Time Girls. Check out our tours and events. Read our blog with podcast notes, etc. at bellinghistory.com. Well, hey there, mama, where'd you go? You gotta read just what you saw. That's too bad, too bad. We'd like to thank Devin Champlin and the late, great Lucas Hicks for the use of the Gallus Brothers song, Too Bad West Coast Blues. You can find the Gallus Brothers tune on Bandcamp, and you can find Devin Champlin at Champlin Guitars in Bellingham. to subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. And tune in next time for more Belling History. Lost my hat, lost my brim, looking like a crow's nest, swinging from a limb, that's too bad, too bad. Well, I got no bugging, I got no smokes, I look like Grand Pap and all of his folks, that's too bad. Thanks, guys.
guys. See ya. Thank you. Thanks.